Yesterday it was a rare day in June. Uh, it was a good day to be in Weiger, and I collected the works of the panelists and just sat and read aimlessly and purposelessly. And uh, I was just immersed in their worlds, realizing that all three of them write about beauty. Uh, they're deeply enmeshed in the in questions of aesthetics, but they also address questions of pain and trauma and suffering. They all three make plain the terrible things of human life. Uh, that's what Trilling said about Robert Frost's poetry. He tells us the terrible things of human life. Uh, and there's a certain comfort in, in that. Uh, so I will begin by introducing um, Jane, Jane Hirschfeld, and we are so lucky to have you here today. I know that you're on your way to Krakow, and is it true that you're reading to the coal miners? You're, yes, you're no, traveling in a coal mine, in a coal mine uh, and no doubt to the coal miners and many others. Uh, she travels all over the world preaching the gospel of poetry. And uh, when I read your um, your poetry yesterday and the sense you should all rush out, go to the Harvard Bookstore the group, and buy a volume of her, her poetry. I read through the beauty last, uh, last night and it, it's just stunning. I will quote just one line and evidently she's gonna read this poem, but it's so beautiful and I repeated it many times to myself and to friends, uh, old shoes, old roads. The questions keep being new ones, like two negative numbers multiplied by rain into oranges and olives. Uh, my favorite is the poem Entanglement, uh, which contains the punchline, Turtles All the Way Down, uh, which of course anthropologists and folklorists and uh, mythographers love, uh, and you can ask her about that. I think we'll have about 20 minutes or so for discussion. Uh, Jane studied at Princeton, uh, and you were in the first class of women to graduate from Princeton. And she immediately went, uh, I'm not sure why, to the Zen Institute in San Francisco uh, to recover. Uh, but, but Princeton and Zen, uh, I love the, com the startling combination. You are a master of paradox and the oxymoron. oxymoron uh, and she has served as uh, Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, uh, something that I'd like to learn more about. And uh, in addition to her many collections of poetry, uh, The Beauty, Given Sugar, Given Salt, uh, Come Thief, After, she's also the author of critical studies of poetry, Ten Windows, How Great Poems Transform the World, and Nine Gates, Entering the world, uh, entering the mind of poetry. So, ten is it ten, ten windows, nine gates. She's also at home in the world of numbers. And uh, <laughs> please welcome Jane Hirschfield. Well, it is an enormous honor to be part of this celebration and to be here uh, with uh, Jamaica and Elaine and all of you. Um, so I am mostly going to be reading poems as Barry and Gretchen asked me to, and uh, some of the poems will have numbers in them, and some will uh, allude to other things that I think all of us who are here today uh, care about and share this interdisciplinary day in honor of an adjective transcending human being. Although you did a pretty good job, effervescence lifting weights. Um, uh, but before I read the poems, I thought I would read uh, one quote uh, which shows uh, the recognition from uh, the other side, i.e. your side, of the confluence between mathematics and poetry which has something to do, I think, with uh, symbolic smallness and largeness being inextricable, um, uh, beauty, elegance, usefulness. And so uh, here are a few words uh, taken out of a lecture by the field's mathematician, uh, Michael Attia, on the subject. In, mathemati in mathematics, 
Beauty is a very important ingredient. Beauty in mathematics, as in architecture and other things, is a difficult thing to define, but it's something you recognize when you see it. It certainly has to have elegant simplicity, structure, form. The aim of the mathematician is to capture as much as you possibly can in small packages, a high density of truth unit per word. And beauty is a criteria for that. If you've got a high density of beauty, it means you've got an awful lot identified in a very small compass. Um, I, I am using this quote in an essay about very short poems that's about to come out. Um, a large, waffly, woolly result is rather dilute. In the absence of experimental science, the mathematician has to test his result by some other criteria. And one of the criteria is simplicity, beauty, and elegance. That shows he's on the right track toward truth in thought. Its appeal is more than just liking a pretty picture. Beauty has significance over and above its immediate attraction. And I know these are very old-fashioned terms. Uh, truth and beauty, and yet we human beings seem uh, really kind of stuck on them. So I'm going to begin with a relatively early poem uh, titled Mathematics, and some of you may recognize in its description of a building uh, the Mormon tabernacle in Salt Lake City. Mathematics. I have envied those who make something useful, sturdy. A chair, a pair of boots, even a soup rich with potatoes and cream, or those who fix perhaps a leaking window, strip out the old cracked putty, lay down cleanly the line of the new. You could learn, the mirror tells me, late at night, but lacks conviction. One reflected eyebrow quivers a little. I look at this borrowed apartment. Everywhere I question it, the wallpaper's pattern matches. Yesterday, a woman showed me a building shaped like the overturned hull of a ship, its roof trusses under the plaster lashed with soaked rawhide, the columns marble painted to seem like wood, though possibly it was the other way around. I look at my unhandy hand, innocent, shaped as the hands of others are shaped. Even the pen it holds is a mystery, really. Rawhide, it writes, and chair, and marble, eyebrow. Later, the woman asked me. I recognized her then, my sister, my own young self. Does a poem enlarge the world, or only our idea of the world? How do you take one from the other, I lied or did not lie in answer. Like two negative numbers multiplied by rain. Lie down, you are horizontal. Stand up, you are not. I wanted my fate to be human. Like a perfume that does not choose the direction it travels, that cannot be straight or crooked, kept out or kept. Yes, no, or. A day, a life slips through them, taking off the third skin, taking off the fourth. The logic of shoes becomes at last simple, an animal question scuffling. Old shoes, old roads. The questions keep being new ones, like two negative numbers multiplied by rain into oranges and olives. <clears throat> like the small hole by the path side something lives in. Like the small hole by the path side something lives in, in me are lives I do not know the names of nor the fates of, nor the hungers of, or what they eat. They eat of me, of small and blemished apples in low fields of me, whose rocky streams and droughts I do not drink. And in my streets, the narrow ones, unlabeled on the self-map, they follow stairs down music ears can't follow. 
and in my tongue borrowed by darkness, in hours uncounted by the self-clock, they speak in restless syllables of other losses, other loves. There too have been the hard extinctions, missing birds once feasted on and feasting. There too must be ideas, like loud machines with tungsten bits that grind the day. A few escape, a mercy. They leave behind small holes that something unweighed by the self-scale lives in. Uh, so I'm going to read also, Mar Maria didn't know I was going to read either of these poems, but the Entanglement poem, um, which I suppose is a, wicked, a little wicked of me because it, uh, it begins set in an academic conference in uh, the David Lodge universe of small worlds where everybody is sleeping with one another. Um, uh, but it is, of course, the entanglement of physics as well. Uh, entanglement. A librarian in Calcutta and an entomologist in Prague sign their moon-faced illicit emails, ton en tonglet. No one can explain it. The strange charm between border collie and sheep, leaf and wind, the two distant electrons. There is, too, the matter of a horse race. Each person shouts for his own horse louder, confident in the rising din past whip, past mud. The horse will hear his own name in his own quickened ear. Desire is different. Desire is the moment before the race is run. Has an electron never refused the invitation to change direction, sent in no knowable envelope with no knowable ring? A story told often. After the lecture, the widow insisting the universe rests on the back of a turtle, and what, the physicist asks, does the turtle rest on? Very clever young man, she replies, very clever, but it's turtles all the way down. And so, a woman in Beijing buys for her love, who practices turtle geometry in Boston, a metal trinket from a night market street stall. On the back of a turtle, at rest on its shell, a turtle. Inside that green painted shell, another, still smaller. This continues for many turtles, until finally, too small to see or to lift up by its curious preacherly head, a single ungreen electron waits the width of a world for some weightless message sent into the din of existence for it alone. Murmur of all that is claspable, clapperable, clamberable, against all that is not. You are there. I am here. I remember. Zero plus anything is a world. I wrote this poem after um, most of my nuclear family had vanished. Four less one is three. Three less two is one. One less three is what is who remains. The first cell that learned to divide learned to subtract. Recipe, add salt to hunger. Recipe, add time to trees. Zero plus anything is a world. This one and no other, unhidden by each breath changed. Recipe, add death to life. Recipe, love without swerve what this will bring. Sister, father, mother, husband, daughter. Like a cello forgiving one note as it goes, then another. Um, this next poem does have numbers in it, rather large numbers. Um, but I, I chose it uh, in celebration of uh, Barry and Gretchen and love. 
because it's a little hard to word uh, to hear the word in the title, uh, Cirrus, the clouds. And I just want to say that the part of the poem which is fact-checkable, uh, I had guessed the numbers uh, just out of the blue and then was absolutely astonished uh, when my friend, the astrophysicist Saul Perlmutter, told me they were correct. Um, I always fact-check my poems with the best of fact-checkers. <laughs> First light edging cirrus. 10 to the 25th molecules are enough to call wood thrush or apple. A hummingbird fewer, a wristwatch, 10 to the 24th. An alphabet's molecules, tasting of honey, iron, and salt, cannot be counted. As some strings, untouched, sound when a near one is speaking. As it was when love slipped inside us, it looked out face to face in every direction. Then it was inside the tree, the rock, the cloud. I have uh, more recently, since uh, the most recent book, uh, there is an ever-increasing number of poems uh, dealing with the crisis of the biosphere. Um, so these are poems that speak to that, and also at least the first couple have numbers in them. As if hearing heavy furniture moved on the floor above us. As things grow rarer, they enter the ranges of counting. Remain this many Siberian tigers, that many African elephants, 300 dead egrets. We scrape from the world its tilt and meander of wonder as if eating the last burned onions and carrots from a cast iron pan, closing eyes to taste better the char of ordinary sweetness. Uh, this next one is going to sound a little different. It is not a perfectly rhyming poem, but it has a lot of uh, sound calling to sound in it. I wrote it when I was able to stay for a month and work uh, at the painter Robert Rauschenberg's old place on Captiva Island. Uh, this was uh, in 2016, which was the rainiest January into February ever recorded in Florida. Um, Captiva will be one of the first places to vanish with sea level rise. Ledger. Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin is 3,592 measures. A voice kept far from feeling is heard as measured. What's wanted in desperate times are desperate measures. Pushkin's unfinished Onegin, 5,446 lines. No visible tears measure the pilot's grief as she lidars the height of an island, five feet. Fifty, its highest leaf. She logs the years, the weathers the tree has left. A million fired clay bones, animal, human, set down in a field as protest measure 400 yards long, 60 yards wide, weigh 112 tons. The length and weight and silence of the bereft. Bees do not question the sweetness of what sways beneath them. One measure of distance is meters, another is li. 10,000 li can be translated far. For the exiled, home can be translated then, translated scar. One liter of Polish vodka holds 12 pounds of potatoes. What we care about most we call beyond measure. What matters most we say counts. Height now is treasure. On this scale of one to 10, where is 11? Ask all you wish, no 25th hour will be given. Measuring mounts, 
like some western bars mounted elk head are catalogued vanishing unfinished heaven. Uh, this next one begins referencing a rather well-known to biologists essay. Ants nest. On being the right size, Haldane's short essay is titled, an ant's nest can be found at the top of a redwood. No bird that weighs less than, no insect more than, the minimum mass for a whale, for a language, an ice cap. In a human-sized room, someone is setting a human-sized table with yellow napkins. Someone is calling her children to come in from a day whose losses as yet remain child-sized. On the fifth day, <coughs> on the fifth day, the scientists who studied the rivers were forbidden to speak or to study the rivers. The scientists who studied the air were told not to speak of the air, and the ones who worked for the farmers were silenced, and the ones who worked for the bees. Someone from deep in the badlands began posting facts. The facts were told not to speak and were taken away. The facts surprised to be taken were silent. Now it was only the rivers that spoke of the rivers and only the wind that spoke of its bees, while the unpausing factual buds of the fruit trees continued to move toward their fruit. The silence spoke loudly of silence, and the rivers kept speaking of rivers, of boulders and air. Bound to gravity, earless and tongueless, the untested rivers kept speaking. Bus drivers, shelf stalkers, code writers, machinists, accountants, lab techs, cellists kept speaking. They spoke the fifth day of silence. What it actually refers to is the fifth day of the current administration, which I'm sure many of you will remember was the day that all references to climate change were taken down from the White House website, and all scientists who work for the government were told not to speak to anyone. And I did not want to leave you too sad, and so I thought I would close with a poem uh, which certainly reflects uh, Barry's character and way of being in the world. Um, I, I wrote it at a time when I myself personally needed the quality it talks about, but also very much in awareness of um, ecological disaster. Uh, the uh, spill in the Gulf, the deep water horizon had happened, and I think uh, most of you probably know what was surprising about that was the extent and the speed to which, yes, irreparable damage, but the recovery surprised those who were looking uh, by how quickly it actually went. And they realized that this was partly because of nothing that human beings were doing, but because the very uh, tiny creatures of the waters themselves were working towards the repair of the skill. Optimism. More and more I have come to admire resilience. Not the simple resistance of a pillow whose foam returns over and over to the same shape, but the sinuous tenacity of a tree. Finding the light newly blocked on one side, it turns in another. A blind intelligence, true, but out of such persistence arose turtles, rivers, mitochondria, figs, all this resinous, unretractable earth. Thank you. <laughs> our next panelist, Jamaica Kincaid. Uh, uh, all of our panelists are poets, and uh, Jermaine Kincaid 
understands the sorcery of words better than almost anyone I know. Uh, her many works of fiction include Annie John, Mr. Potter, See Now Then, and The Wonderful Lucy, which I started yesterday and uh, then stayed up reading. Uh, extraordinary. Uh, and I did stay up late. Uh, Mallorcan fairy tales begin not with Once Upon a Time, but with It Was and It Was Not. And uh, when I read Jamaica's, um, uh, this is uh, part of an interview, Jamaica's words about her writing, everything I say is true and everything I say is not true. I, I was reminded of it was and it was not. She's won many prizes, uh, received many honorary doctorates at Tufts, Brandeis, um, other places. Uh, I will not recite them all. You can read them on Wikipedia. There's a long, long list. Uh, I will just tell you about one of her great claims to fame. Um, I discovered this on, on Wikipedia as well. It happened in 1996 when she resigned from The New Yorker after Tina Brown, the editor, chose actress Roseanne Barr to guest edit an issue as an original feminist voice. Well, <laughs> Jamaica, I think you're going to read from your work this morning and maybe tell us about uh, your adventures at The New Yorker and other places okay. all over the world. Thank you very much for Gretchen and Barry for having me here. I, I say to Elaine, I can't understand why they have dinner with me every week. I try to tell them that uh, um, it's, uh, they should have it with someone uh, else, but they insist, and I, um, it's a great uh, thing for me. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, they put up with me saying things like, um, uh, saying to Barry, for instance, well, if you took the earth and put a large pin right through it, where would it come out? And um, Barry tried to explain to me about how the planets were really, uh, um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> or, for instance, when I said to him, well, you know, I just don't like numbers, and he winced. Because if someone said to me they didn't like um, words, you can say to me you don't, you don't like the alphabet because I learned to read without knowing that there was such a thing called the alphabet. Um, so if you say that you don't like letters, it's okay because I I'm only interested in words. So um, when I said that uh, and, and um, I, I tried to explain to him that the thing about numbers is that they. They, they actually stay still, uh, zero is zero apparently, and will never be anything but zero. And I like things that I can modify, and um, can make is and not is, so, um, but he still, he, they love me anyway, and um, I love them. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, even if I'll never know why. Um, <laughs> I, 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 they both, um, uh, I can't separate them. They both have, Barry and Richard have a, I call them the Bee Gees. So, they have a, an enormous influence on me in, um, for instance, the way I, I am a parent, um, they are so they they are such loving uh, people um, that I just said, oh, looked at them and said, oh, this is how you do it, and it um, made me into a better parent. They 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 could give you lessons on this, and uh, if they did, your children would just love you forever, um, <laughs> even if you don't want them to. <laughs> um, so there's that. But um, I can see that, uh, I wrote this book, um, and I can see the, 
the influence that speaking to Barry, the numbers thing, would have had on me. I'm always very interested in time, which I think a lot of people have interpreted as um, interested in autobiography and memory and so on, which is also true, but it's essentially, uh, uh, I'm interested in how you make sense of time. Um, I think I once asked Elaine this other question, this question, you might not remember, but um, uh, I was reading um, about the Earth's atmosphere and it said it rained for 100 million years of some poisonous gas and um, then at the end of it, we live in the at we ended up with the atmosphere we are in. And so I said to Elaine, well, when they say 100 million years, is it like 100 million, 365, 24? And do you remember this? No. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and she said, well, uh, um, well I, I, I think so, because it's just a sort of question I think about all the time. Um, and every once in a while I allow myself to um, tell someone this is what um, I'm thinking. Uh, but then yesterday, I think it was, I was reading um, that the days were getting longer because the moon um, was doing something, the moon moves away from the earth, and I thought, oh, well, that question of, you know, the hours of days and so on wasn't so silly uh, uh, after all. I still don't understand it. But I, I suppose what I, um, I was trying to do, and, and Barry and Gretchen are responsible for this, I think trying to understand what it is, um, to, how you capture, how we, as human beings, capture time, how we make um, an hour, for instance, how, why, why is it 60 something or, anyway. Um, so this book, uh, this passage from which I'm going to read you, it's called See Now Then, and if you think about the title a little bit, you'll see that it has to do with the time, um, because you can, well, what is now? This is now, but then uh, in a little bit it will be then. And it's always now and then is what I was trying to see how to think about a life. Um, so I took a family in and uh, put them in England, and um, they are falling apart. They live in a house called the Shirley Jackson House. And they don't live in a house called the Robert Frost House because in a house in New England, Robert Frost's son, Carol, killed himself. And this family is not that kind of family. They are a Shirley Jackson kind of family. Um, so, and then they, they are, it's a mother and a father, they're named Mr. and Mrs. Sweet. And if you were to read the book, you'd see they were not at all sweet people. And uh, they have two children. Um, who's named a boy named Heracles and a girl named Persephone. And um, the children have characteristics that would reflect. <coughs> if you are <coughs> Apollodorus, you will see what I mean. Um, so I'll just read you a little bit of it um, in, in, as a tribute to Barry, a tribute to Barry, and oh, therefore Gretchen. I love you both. Um, I don't think I tell you enough. Thank you. Um, so the family is, um, oh, now I've lost all the great parts <laughs> that I was going to read. Um, uh, so Mrs. Sweet's um, husband has said goodbye to her and um, because he finds her an abomination. Um, she knits him an orchestra, but she uh, forgets to knit the hands that would play the instruments. She's um, incompetent, so he has to leave her. And it upsets the children. So, uh, here it is. Uh, but she, Mrs. Sweet, could see the young Heracles sitting on a couch in the children's room, watching Michael Jordan and Scotty Pippen and Dennis Rodman defeat Carl Malone and John Stockton and Michael Jordan 
who then had a very bad cold, and each time he made a score, he almost fell down, but his fellow teammate, Scotty Pippin, was always there to hold him up, and the young Heracles, who worshipped Michael Jordan, held his opponents in high disregard and said they were lame, and Mrs. Sweet knitted and purled all the while, listening to her son whoop and shout and moan and cry out in agony at the very <coughs> idea that his beloved Michael Jordan's team would lose. But then they won, and the young Heracles said to his mother, Hey, Mom, I know you're going to say this is just like Homer, this is just like the Iliad, and there is a Geminin, and there is Achilles coming up to save everything. Admit it, Mom, you're going to say it's just like in Homer, in that funny little voice of yours, as if you're on the radio, because you talk like someone on the radio. Your voice is official, but you're just my mom, and you're so ridiculous. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. You are so embarrassing. And Mrs. Sweet knitted away, for she was right then making the entire orchestra that would perform Mr. Sweet's, that would perform Mr. Sweet's suite of nocturnes. But much to her surprise, when this tour was completed, the performers were all missing one of the arms they needed to play their instruments. So inevitable, so inevitable are the series of events seen over your shoulder as you glance back from the series of events that stand before you, and in your own mind, you can see the series of events that are to come, that are arrayed before you, and they appear as if they are in the rearview mirror, but only in reverse, only as if the rearview mirror could make visible the thing that has not happened yet, for perhaps time, said Mrs. Sweet to herself as she knitted away those garments with one sleeve missing, was a father, not a mother, and Mrs. Sweet had no father. That is, she had not been authored. She had been created by a very malicious woman. Oh, mom, oh, mom, can't you see, said the young boy to his mother. And he was jumping up and down, running this way and that, through the assembled crowds of shy myrmidons, ninja turtles, power rangers, Super Mario Batman, various figurines from Star Wars, various stuffed animals, stuffed animals, some resembling the domesticated, some resembling wild ones who are now extinct, and they all lay before him, and also they all lay before him in his memory, so fresh, so fresh and so clean, Mrs. Jackson, that they still inhabited his now, and the boy, young Heracles, was now involved in the sadness of worrying about Ken Griffey, whose father had been a legend of baseball lore, and so the young Heracles told his mother. And the young Heracles loved the young Griffey and was so involved in his fate, which not, might not be so full of glory as was his Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman. But just then, as he was sitting in his chair in the children's room, his father, Mr. Sweet, said to him, I must tell you something. And Mr. Sweet said, I don't love your mother anymore. I love another woman who comes from somewhere else, another woman with whom I have been taking ballroom dancing lessons, and we talk about Mozart. For she plays the piano forte excellently, and she could be the next extraordinary piano genius of the century. The century is long because centuries are long, though in your life you might, you might, ha, 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 find them, not as long as I have found them, but I love her and nothing can change that, and I don't love your mother. You know, we were always so incompatible, for she did emerge from a boat whose main cargo was bananas. And she is strange, and she would live in the attic of a house that burns down. Though I don't want her to be in it when that happens, but if she was in it when the house burned down, I wouldn't be surprised. She is that kind of person. And on hearing all this, oh no, was a long howl of pain that came out of the bowels through the darkness of the mouth of the young Heracles. And he furled and unfurled again and again like the petals of a flower as it comes into bloom and then fades rapidly. So did the young Heracles, who had only been sitting in his chair in the children's room, watching on television the young ball player Ken Griffey in the process of being or never being the great baseball player all the baseball world thought he would be. <clears throat> In the corner of that
that room in which the young Heracles heard the indictment against his sacred mother. He loved her so. He thought her ridiculous, her obsession with plants and flowers and fruits that they bear, her wanting to wear jumpers made of denim, the uniform of workmen in some faraway country, to parents night at his school so all the other parents could see that she wasn't at all like them, her love of cooking food that took a long time to prepare, duck with plum sauce, that took days before it was ready to be eaten. The other mothers didn't know that she could sing all the words to Stan and that she loved Dr. Dre. She once went off to China and spent weeks there collecting the seeds of plants she could grow in her garden. That time she told a man who was taking his family on a shopping on a, on his family on a shopping outing to Manchester and he took her parking spot before she had a chance to position her car properly. And he, he took her parking spot before she had a chance to position her car properly. Maybe your dick will fall off. And the man, who had never been spoken to like that before, in front of his treasured family, came in rage, so much so that it filled him with shame. And he almost collapsed from it. But he soon recovered and did not yield at this parking spot. And he proceeded to the Ralph Lauren outlet and was never seen again by the young Heracles. And mom is so ridiculous, and she is so ridiculous, and mom is so ridiculous. He thought of the time when she had taught him to make her a martini so he could bring it to her at half past five in the afternoon while she was in the garden doing something that nobody in the rest of the family cared about. And there was this day when Mr. Sweet came into the house and said to the young Heracles, have you seen my beautiful wife? And Heracles answered, no, but if you're looking for mom, she's in the garden. And, and mom, who loved the garden as if it were a person or something like that, so thought the young Heracles. And none of the other mothers were like that. None of them thought the garden was like a person and had an individual need and that it called for attention and care and could enrich your inner life. So thought the young Heracles. None of my friends and mothers were like mom, and it is so embarrassing. Mom is so embarrassing. If she wasn't my own mom, I would have gone out and found a mom who wasn't like her at all. A mom who was just like the other moms, for mom is so embarrassing. And just outside the room in which corner lay the shy Myrmidons and the Ninja Turtles and the Power Rangers and Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, though never at all Princess Leia, and Batman, though never at all Robin. Just outside the room was the tree house that Rob had built with wood Mr. Sweet had ordered to measure from Greenberg's lumber store, and Rob had nailed the wood into the evergreens that had been planted in the yard just outside the Shirley Jackson house. And Mr. Sweet said, I love your mother. I will always love your mother. She is dear to me, the dear Mr. Sweet. But she is so awful. Did you hear the way she talked to the waiters? She's so objectionable. I would never tell you this because I really couldn't. In our house, we celebrated Christmas and Easter, and we were never rude to people who waited on us. And your mother would be of the people who waited on us. But you know, she, your mother, was so interesting when I first knew of her. She was interested in the arrangement of the firmament, and I bought her a telescope for her birthday, and she loved insects, butterflies especially, and I gave her a net to catch them, for I knew of Nabokov, and she didn't know of Nabokov. Nabokov. And it was such a pleasure, pleasure to see her delight in all that I could show her. She really rewarded my efforts, but then she grew into a monster. And one day I noticed that she was rude to waiters, and I could have been rude to waiters, but I knew that such a thing was wrong. But one day she went to Old Days and Onions, uh, to get special capers, and she saw the waitress speaking kindly to a man, an ugly man, and the waitress said to that ugly man, hello handsome, what can I get for you today? And after the transaction, your mother said to the waitress, how can you speak to such an ugly man? And the waitress said, that was my husband. <laughs> And your mother returned to me, and she was filled with a description of fields of pink flowers that were shaped like fists, 
and it was to see this, the fields of pink flowers like this, that made her take that made her take that route to the old days and onions, and it was there she insulted the waitress and her husband, and that was the final straw. It was then I wanted to be with someone who could, wouldn't instinctively be unkind to people who waited on me and my mother and my father and my brother and his familiar, and your mother was someone who couldn't make such a distinction. I wish she minced words. I wish she would bite off her tongue, I wish she would simply become dead. Oh, young Heracles, oh, young Heracles, where are you? Are you under the blanket of my despair? That is your mother, that truly abominable woman, your mother, Mrs. Sweet. Um. Listen to this right now, Mr. Sweet was saying, I love you, but I don't love you in the way I love someone so superior to even myself, someone I shouldn't be allowed to even speak to. She's so wonderful and outside any realm I have ever known. And Mrs. Sweet heard all these words, but couldn't understand them really, and could only see Mr. Sweet as he would one day be covered with small worms crawling and crawling through, going only from his head to his toes and no further than that, than that, and then his whole body was like lace work, beautiful and useless, waiting to be turned into something, the bodice of a dress or the top of bo top border of curtains, something seen in passing and in the end annoying. Listen, Mr. Sweet was saying, and now Mrs. Sweet turned into not stone but a mound of mud, and sorrow became her middle name as if she possessed one, but she did not then and not now and she sank into her ancient landscape, and that would be memory, and that would be her mother, and that landscape had a horizon, and she longed again and again to see the end of it, to see the horizon and stand on it, and see the thing it held, or the nothing within it. My mother was very beautiful, and I was ashamed of this. I was so ashamed of my mother's beauty. Things change, Mr. Sweet was saying to Mrs. Sweet, things change, but that was the harsh version, for he was in a state of rage. His voice was like a Wilkinson razor, was like a Wilkinson razor blade, newly merged from that ironmonger's factory. His arms jabbed at her, but stopped short of making contact with the inconsolable mass of flesh, heaving with sorrow, and then resting from that. Things change, sweetie, things change. And he twitched his hips and shook his head vigorously, dancing to a music that was heard only by him. Or so Mrs. Sweet said to herself on seeing him then. And then he began to hum out loud parts of the rite of spring, the sea, the cat, the spider's web, the rat, the dog, the child's bed. And after he was done with that, he said to his wife, now shorn of her former dignity, Mrs. Sweet, and she was wearing a lovely brown dress made by Lilith. I never loved you, you know, I never loved you. Not because you were unlovable, though really you are. No one could love you. Not even me who knew nothing about love then, but now I do, and I see that I never loved you. For you are like walking into barbed wire in the dark. You are like an invitation to a tea party in an ant nest. You are like you were like, I can't any longer right now think of what you were like. So said Mr. Sweet to Mrs. Sweet, and just then, right then, she was so beside herself with grief, and she wept, and her tears watered the primula capitata, which she had planted under the giant white pine tree. And so her tears were most welcomed by that delicate plant, native as it is to the moist regions of the Himalayas. And she wept and wept, and Mr. Sweet spoke to her as she was bent over the parched, the parched primroses, themselves wilting and prostrate, prostrate on the ground, suffering from the harsh conditions under which they were forcibly being cultivated in the crotch of the roots of an evergreen native to Canada, though they came from the Himalayan region of the world. And Mrs. Sweet wept and wept and wept some more, for Mr. Sweet said then to her, you are just crying because you know the children and I will never forgive or forget the terrible things you have said and done. And that made her die a death in which she was still alive 
not dead at all, but still alive and yet dead. For he showed her life as she had been living in it. The moment when the beautiful Persephone had to be put to bed at dusk, but she re resisted it always, for she wanted to be with her parents. They did things that were mysterious to her, and she would delay that moment when she would be placed in her crib, for she, she had not yet outgrown it, and a thickly woven cotton blanket would be drawn up and carefully arranged under her chin, for her arms were folded up into her body like a bird, if you were baking it as a delicious dish to be served for dinner. Mrs. Sweet died and died in this way, for she lived for a long time, dying over and over again, <coughs> never coming to a rest, a state of not then, not to come, not to have been, only now, only die and die and die. And Mrs. Sweet died, she did die, and never again were the denim jodhpas that, that had been given to her by her friend Rebecca, who had seen them being worn by municipal workers in Japan when she was on a visit there. Each day has 24 hours, each week has seven of those years, of those days, each year has 52 weeks, and it is so. And the age of the earth is made up of more than four billion years, of those years and weeks and days and hours, then, now, and then again, forcibly enclosed in it. And it was and is and will be so, Mrs. Sweet said to herself over and over again, as if for a song that had been carried on the wind and she had heard it and taken it to heart, a song heard while walking along the banks of the Batten Kill River for 28 miles, and she stood still then, seeing in her mind's eye the winding course the river would take, ending with it emptying itself into the Hudson River, some distance away from that place where the sea's tides influence the river. All that is to come will change the way right now is seen. Right now is so certain, right now is forever. What is to come will make, distort, and even erase right now. Right now will be replaced by another right now. And right now is all there is, and all there is over and over again. And no welling up of the fluids in the individual stomach. A universal metaphor for the unstableness of the whole human enterprise, as it is experienced by the person making breakfast for the litter of domesticated uh, mammals before her or him, and the boy and girl with Game Boy or Super Mario in hand, as the case may be, no matter how it is heard, no matter how it is felt, and it is such a disappointment right now, for right now is always so incomplete, or so we feel, and that is a blessing, for it transforms then into what will come, all that will come, even though all that will come must contain right now and the unfathomable longing for the then, that time to come, after the earth was pre-Cambrian, Hadian, Protozoic, Paleozoic, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Cretaceous, and lower this and lower that, and then upper that too, and then Cenozoic, and rifting, and volcanic, that time to come after the earth was itself, that time to come was the time that had been before, for beyond the earth's boundaries was all that had made it, was all that had been and is, and the future was the past and the past, which is then, it is always then, could be found in the periodic table. And Mrs. Sweet looked up and saw that pinned to the doors of the pantry was a map illustrating the principles of that thing itself, the periodic table. The beautiful Persephone showed an interest in chemistry, and her mother had purchased it and placed it there. And then Mrs. Sweet looked out the window through the panes of glass that separated and shielded her from all that lay outside the Shirley Jackson house, the house in which she lived with her children and her husband. And she could see a landscape so different from the one in which she was formed, that paradise of persistent sunshine and pleasant weather, a paradise so complete it immediately rendered itself as hell. Outside now, there was spring and in it on the banks of the River Parron and stretching out onto the flanks of the Taconic and the Green Mountain Ranges were large trees and some of them, some of them evergreen, some of them deciduous and right then in bud. Thank you.
here is Elaine on being an academic. Uh, from, I think this is from the New York Times Magazine. There's a wonderful article about you from, what is it, about 2009 or so? Oh, maybe. <laughs> anyway, you can look it up. There's nothing about being an English professor that exempts you from the normal obligations of citizenship, she says firmly. In fact, you have an increased obligation because you know how to do research. And that is Elaine, uh, who does research and carries out the cultural work of linking aesthetics and ethics, of understanding the connection. Uh, her writings take us to the intersection of, of beauty and trauma, as I mentioned before. First with the body and pain, her landmark study of violence and, and torture. It's a book that instantly became authoritative, became part of the canon. And then, more recently, the body in more pain with her extraordinary thermonuclear monarchy which explores the consequences of placing control of nuclear weapons and the authority to launch them in the hands of our president. In 2014, uh, we're now at the other end of the spectrum, and there is hope. Uh, uh, actually, I think, am I giving the right date for beauty and not being just? That was earlier, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, in any, well, we don't have to worry about uh, dates. Uh, this is a book that defends beauty as a moral resource. It's also a book that changed the life of many of my students who read it, read it, and then develop brain crushes on Professor Scary. And uh, they also read parts of Dreaming by the Book, Nerd Heaven, uh, for those of us who are passionate readers as, as children. This is a book that tells us many things, uh, but among them, how writers animate their universes, how they create vivacity, and how they enable us to see and feel when they have nothing but words. And Elaine, I understand, is going to talk about Plato, and you will get to see vivacity in action. So, um, in a book called The Conduct of the Understanding, John Locke says that the surest way to stop thinking is to read writings only in one field and to speak to people only in one field. So, I think that means that even if math and poetry had nothing to do with one another, John Locke would probably say that practitioners of math should read or write poetry and poets and readers of poetry should uh, become more conversant with math. But as it happens, and as, um, as we've already heard, uh, math and, po and poetry do have uh, something to do with one another, even if the continuity isn't quite as immediate and profound as that between music and math. Um, for one thing, poetry is almost impossible to describe. The formal properties of poetry are almost impossible to talk about without using um, counting words like couplets, quatrains, uh, terza rima, octave, sestet, sestina, octava rima, iambic pentameter, iambic hexameter, um, triolets, and so forth. They're all counting words. Um, second, as again, as, as you heard uh, from very eloquent people today, um, both realms have a great deal to do with, with um, beauty, Probably all of you have heard Barry Mazur say, as I've heard him say um, many times, that there's no necessary reason, as far as he can see, why a mathematical proof has to be beautiful. It just happens to be the case that they always are. Um, and I won't try to point out the beauty of poetry. Um, third, uh, and again, this is something that's already been um, eloquently described today, that both of them have to do, require of us, a kind of mental, a work of mental picturing. Um, mental picturing in numbers that are hard to picture or imagine, uh, like those that can't be expressed by uh, a fraction in which one number is put over the other number, um, or the kind of uh, work that, that uh, you know, Jamaica or Jane uh, require of us, 
in the kind of mental picture making. And Barry, um, as you all know, has written an incredible book called Imagining Numbers, particularly the square root of minus 15, where he pivots back and forth continuously between the feet of, or trying to bring about the feet of picturing um, numbers and the way in which uh, somebody like Yeats or Oscar Wilde or Virginia Woolf or Wallace Stevens or Nabokov or Melville or Coleridge or John Ashbery or many others, and he calls on all of these people, um, perform their work of image making. And as extraordinary as the poems that, um, that Barry himself writes, love poems for Gretchen or poems to Zeke or poems to a uh, greeting to Naya are uh, his own, uh, is his own knowledge and, and as well as Gretchen's knowledge of, of um, poetry. Um, now, poetry uh, shares another feature with math. This conference is titled The Long Conversation and Imagining Numbers ends by Barry saying that mathematics is one of the longest conversations that mankind has and that its most treasured conclusions are, are always a springboard for future questions and answers. And when we reconvene on Barry's 100th birthday, I'll um, outline for you the, the analogy this has with uh, poetry. But for today, I'm just going to talk about one brief chapter of the account of poetry that can be given, and that's the account given by Plato. Um, and the um, Probably you've heard it said that Plato dismisses poetry uh, because he does banish them from the Republic in the 10th book. But as it happens, Plato's works are saturated with love and respect for poetry. And it's a mystery to me how this sentence that he dismisses poetry uh, gets said so many times a week on the ground of this university and the ground of every other university. Um, and I want to just take one brief instance of um, his commitment to poetry in the works he wrote describing the accusation against Socrates and uh, the, the actual death of Socrates. Um, so those four works are the Euthyphro, in which Socrates is, uh, we're, we're made acquainted with the accusation against Socrates, and that dialogue happens, as you'll remember, right outside the law courts. Then comes the apology, which is the actual trial of Socrates, where we hear him making several speeches trying to defend himself. Um, then comes the crito, where he's in prison, and his friends try to help him escape, but uh, he refuses to accept their help. And then comes the Phaedo, not to be confused with the Phaedrus, the Phaedo, which is again in prison, but this time on the evening um, of the morning on which he will, will die. And the, unlike um, many of his uh, works, like the, let's say, the Ion, or the Symposium, or the Phaedrus, um, or Greater <coughs> Hippias, or the Laws, um, this is not a work that overtly deals centrally with poetry. Um, the, the matters in these four dialogues are things like um, the duty to justice argument. Now, for example, in the Crito, Socrates says, in war and in the court of justice and everywhere, you must do whatever your country tells you to do, or you must persuade them that they're being unjust. Um, and that argument has a much more current articulation in John Rawls's duty to justice argument, which is a, a restatement of it, um, you have an obligation to uphold just arrangements where they already exist, and you have an obligation to try and bring them about where they don't already exist, uh, at least if you can do that without harming yourself. But then there's also um, another idea, which is the, um, the, the uh, uh, tacit consent through residence. Uh, that you must, uh, that you consent to a country by residing in it. Uh, the idea of um, that that the nature of justice doesn't change depending on how far you are from death. Um, it, 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 the requirements of justice are the same whether it's the night before you die, or whether, as will happen in the Fido, or whether you're ten years away. Um, and then there is the uh, famous statement that 
reappear for many centuries afterward, the definition of philosophy, philosophy is learning how to die, which is um, the statement made in the, in the Phaedo. Now, in each of these, um, in the brief time that I've remaining, uh, he uh, makes clear, Plato makes clear the continuity between the aspirations of Socrates and the work of, play, of uh, poetry. For example, in the uh, Euthyphro, um, and, and I should say that in all four of them, we're going to see the unstoppability of Socrates. He's accused not only of blaspheming against the gods by his own daemon, uh, but by transmitting, by teaching, and that is really what he is on trial for. And, uh, and yet in each of them, he's going to um, replace law with education, uh, essentially, starting on the steps of the law courts and then moving into the, the, to the law courts. And we're going to see that kind of him going on talking endlessly the whole time. But one of the things that uh, Euthyphro and Socrates um, see is that, that Socrates says that his father is Daedalus. Daedalus was the great artificer the great sculptor. And Euthyphro and Socrates agree that what made, uh, what made um, Daedalus the famous artificer was the fact that his sculptors, his artifacts, were so lifelike they appeared to move. And again, both Euthyphro and Socrates agree that what Daedalus did with material sculpture, S Socrates can do with verbal arguments. And in fact, um, Socrates says, I think that I might even be a bigger genius than Daedalus because he could only make his own artworks move, whereas I can make not only my own verbal statements move, but I can make other people's verbal statements move. Um, and and uh, then in the Apology, um, where he is going to at first defend himself against 501 jurors, and then after they convict him, he goes on to uh, address the fact that they're now going to have a second trial on what his punishment should be. Um, and then, uh, by the way, more people vote for him to be executed than had voted for him to be guilty, so it shows that his talking is not winning any, any friends. Um, but the, the, uh, then the third speech he makes is, um, is addressed specifically to those people who voted against execution. Um, now, he's relentlessly told us that he's not going to stop talking and teaching. He says at the moment when he's, when he's being invited to, to offer up an alternative punishment, um, he says, I'm not going to recommend that you, you banish me. Although, by the way, if you banish me, I would delight in having conversations with all the young foreign students. Um, he says instead that they should give him a stipend so he can go on talking. Um, and they, they reject that alternative. Uh, but then after they um, vote to execute him, he addresses himself only to those people who have um, voted against execution. And he's talking to them to try and make them feel more at ease with the fact that he's about to die. Um, and, uh, and he says, you shouldn't feel bad because one of two things is true. Either there's no consciousness after death, in which case it's just like a sleep and it'll be fine, or it, if we do have consciousness, and if we have consciousness, that means that I'm going to be able to talk to all the people who have died before me. But the, you might ask yourself, how can this statement that Plato dismisses the poets continue, and be, continue to be reiterated day after day um, when just for example, you have him saying um, that he wants to talk to Orpheus, Musaeus, Hesiod, and Homer. Well, I'm going to tell you um, how. Um, he, uh, he says that, uh, or, or if you look at the actual um, edition, one of the best translations of, um, of the Apology, that was published by Penn Winslow, a leading uh, publisher, between 1954 and 1994, had superscripts in that sentence where he lists Orpheus, Musaeus, Hesiod, and Homer, and th then gives footnotes. 
So the footnote for Orpheus says, says, Orpheus is no doubt mentioned not as a singer and a poet, but as the founder of Orpheism. An astonishing statement about Orpheus. But if you go into this believing uh, that, that, Socrates, that Plato and Socrates rejected the poets, then you have to work very hard to account for all these other things he says. He says something similar about Musaeus. Musaeus was a bard like Orpheus, but his benefactions consisted in giving oracles. And Hesiod is being quoted because he is um, very, very didactic. Um, the, now, if you can actually get rid of proper nouns that easily, think how easy it is to get rid of ordinary nouns or ordinary adjectives. For example, in the ion, the word kalos re recurs at least eight times in connection with poetry. And yet, rather than translating that beauty, it's usually translated, at least in the translations I've looked at, by the words splendid and fine, which are legitimate synonyms um, and translations. But it severs poetry from the what it was, everyone agrees is a great matter for Plato, the nature of beauty. Um, in fact, the, so, so true is that, that, um, that one of the, uh, one, one very uh, famous reader of Plato, Christopher Janway, says there is little reason to think that this beauty itself has much to do with the arts as such, on the basis of, uh, and he's talking about the ion. Now, again, in the Crito, so the third of them, when now Socrates is in, in jail, and I'm losing track of time, am I okay with time? Okay. Um, so in, in the Crito, um, the, the Socrates is saying, look, I'm not going to take the escape route. Um, I don't want to dress up in a costume and put on some theatrical play and pretend to be someone else. And yet, he himself generates a, a miniature play or dialogue by suddenly um, imagining and making us believe that a woman not named the Laws is there, and it is uh, this, the Laws who give the explanations for why you're not allowed to escape. Um, why you have to accept the state's right to punish, even if the state has made a mistake in, in that. And, you know, at the time, in the, in the classical period, um, Plato's dialogues were seen as a great poetic invention. For example, Di someone named Diogenes Laertes um, says that of all the practitioners of dialogue, um, the perfect, the most perfect instance of it um, and the one who deserves the prize for both invention and beauty, and again, I'm, I'm quoting, I'm not I'm using my own vocabulary, is Plato. And we know that Aristotle, in his, in his work that we only have a fragment of called On Poets, says that Plato's dialogues fall between poetry and prose. Um, and then um, Cicero also said that Plato uh, is a greater poet than the comic uh, poets, and that, con that condition, that continues forever afterwards. So here's somebody who, let's just exaggerate and say he invents, or at least he perfects, and that's not an exaggeration, the dialogue form. Um, inside this dialogue, we watch Socrates create a dialogue. And it's not a dialogue based on some historical reporting. It's a dialogue based on imitating a divine truth, the nature of law, the true nature of law and justice and enacting it. So we're getting a, a miniature, and this is important because um, Socrates and Plato will say in the Theotetus that what differentiates mere opinion from knowledge is the ability to have a form that's cognate with the content, uh, that the form has to recreate the content of an idea. Um, and, and that is what we watch him doing at every moment. Now finally, when you get to the, um, the Phaedo, as you remember, the friends come to the prison and say, Socrates, what are you doing? Um, someone told us that you've been trying to write a hymn to Apollo and that you're trying to translate Aesop into verse. What can you be um, thinking of? And uh, Socrates says, well, you know, throughout my whole life, I've heard a voice saying, cultivate and practice the arts. And I thought I was doing this by doing philosophy because I've always thought philosophy was the highest art. But now that I'm getting close to death, 
I'm beginning to worry that maybe they were talking literally and using the word the way the popular world, world uses it, and they really mean poetry. So just to cover myself, I'm going to try to write a hymn, and he finds out I'm not very good. And he says, and also, I'm not really good at invention, so I'm going to take one of Aesop's fables and try and turn it into um, to verse. Not very inventive. Before that passage has even begun, we've watched Socrates create a fable when the executioner takes the fetters off his limbs, and so he suddenly feels uh, the cessation of pain. He creates a little story about the kinship of, of play, pain and pleasure and says, that was actually as good as Aesop. So he has foregrounded not only his own invention, but the place of imagining, the place of invention um, in all of this. And then finally, um, as you may remember, at the end of this, uh, or near the end of this, this um, as, the, as the night's going on, and, and he's talking away and away, and remember the executioner says to him, Socrates, you've got to stop talking because the hemlock is not going to work if you're aerating your whole body by talking um, so much. Um, and uh, I think Socrates says, you're just going to have to give me more and, you know, than that. But they say to him, um, you know, Socrates, um, even after you give us lots of rational arguments about why we shouldn't be um, afraid of death, um, and, and of course many of the dialogues uh, give explanations about about why we shouldn't be afraid of death, but this one has a special, obvious gravity and poignancy because um, he's about to die. Uh, some of you may know this statement by the 19th century novelist George Eliot about the difference between the general proposition, all men must die, and the particular uh, knowledge, I must die, and soon. And, and that's the situation we're in, in the Phaedo. Um, they say, they say to him, how, uh, how, even after you give us all these rational arguments about, about why we shouldn't be afraid of death, there remains a child in us that is afraid as though of a hobgoblin, of dying, and what can we do about that? <clears throat> and Socrates says, <clears throat> let the words of the charmer be applied daily until they have charmed away your fears. And, uh, and this, the friends say, but where will we find such a charmer, Socrates, when you are gone? And Socrates says, well, you must, you must look all over for him. It's the most important thing you can do. You should search all of Greece and all of uh, Asia Minor. Um, so again, knowing that the importance that philosophy is learning how to die, and, and that's the reason why he felt that someone with a philosophic frame of mind had the greatest possibility of courage um, because they had, if they'd done their work properly, had, had learned how to die. Um, you can see the, the, um, the importance of this, which is um, validated in many of his other writings as well. Thank you. But keeping that in mind, and uh, maybe you could say a few words about oh, that, what Keats called negative capability, the capacity to remain in mystery, uncertainty, and doubt. Well, while, while people are thinking, uh, I'll just say that in, in reading uh, various poems, which, I, which as I said, are, are uh, wonderful love poems to Gretchen and, and descriptions, love of the world, um, there was one poem that struck me as sounding a false note. <laughs> um, it was about being annoyed by uh, the sounds of, <laughs> of, of uh, the 4th of July. And I thought to myself, you know, I see this person every, at least once a week for several hours. I've never seen him be annoyed. Have any of you ever seen Barry Mesa be annoyed? I mean, in a, in a, in a universe in the university universe where um, so often people are indignant or angry or... 
I, I've actually never seen Barry Windsor be annoyed, so I knew it was just a, a kind of what we call in poetry a narrative excuse for, uh, for describing the different sounds of, uh, the, as it happens, the 4th of July. Uh, so he had to say he was annoyed in order to give us a wonderful description. Um, I, I'm just counting that as, as among the horrible things of annoyance. You can write about the culture of outrage, and Barry is the exception. Uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, to make it, do you have anything to add on negative capability or autobiography? Tell it, can you respond to? Uh, I, I remember reading a critic who was, who was outraged, indignant, that you're writing this autobiographical, oh, yes. as if all writing were not autobiographical. <laughs> um. <clears throat> um, yes, it's autobiographical, or I'm angry, or I'm, um, or all sorts of things that um, you would apply to a description of a person's character, not a piece of writing. But I only, I mean, I just can see that that has to do with my physical appearance, and the things I write about are not what people expect um, someone who looks like me should write about. And so instead of just saying, um, oh, why would this black woman write about black woman things in a way that is so familiar, they say, oh, she's angry. But um, so I don't, I, I dismiss it. But um, um, I, don't, I don't, I mean, negative, I, 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 I couldn't really answer. Um, that question, negative capability. Um, no, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> or do we have a, a, a look well, for it? I have too much to say about negative capability. Um, and, and the end of that quote is without any irritable reaching for reasons and facts, or facts and reasons. Um, luckily for you, I don't memorize my poems, so I can't recite for you my poem against certainty. Um, but I, I think that this, um, so an idea I have held for, for quite a long time is that the most dangerous thing in the world is a person who is sure they are right. Um, this is what allows tyrants, dictatorship, fundamentalism, uh, the absolute certainty that you know the correct thing allows you to do terrible things to other human beings. Um, a teaching in Buddhism, which I much have, have long had great affection for, is that all Buddhism rests on a tripod. Um, great effort, great faith, and great doubt. And so the practice of Zen, which is the school of, of, of Buddhism, which I have uh, been part of for some decades. Um, it is very much about maintaining your doubt of all your ideas, all your perceptions, at the same time as you embrace your ideas. It's not nihilism. It is the embrace of the particular, the treasuring of the feeling of being alive in this world. That final passage of your reading was so gorgeous to me. It was, I, I just fell into a complete swoon for its love of, of the world. Um, but I think it is, it is some testament to the peculiarity of our current times that I, as a poet, was reading you a poem in defense of facts. How can we have come to such a pass that I have to write a poem on the fifth day in defense of facts. I, who believe that the work of poetry is so greatly the work of abiding in the unanswerable mystery of our lives. You know, we will never really know about death. We only speculate from this side of death. And yet it is the job of poetry to extend a hand into the terror and hope and despair of the fact that our lives will end and say, it's all right. Feel all those things. It is all right to feel all those things. It is what makes us human. Um, and that's probably enough for me to say.
that's a wonderful note on which to end things, but we do have one minute, and I don't want to deprive us of another minute with the panelists. Uh, could you just, each of you, say something about the cult of the writer today? And the way in which writing is a form of self-actualization, as we see this in Hollywood all the time. What do what do young women aspire to, uh, but to becoming becoming a writer? And what writing and words have meant uh, for you? I'm just I'm just struck by the immensity of that subject because the uh, in in English department at Harvard, and I think in many, many schools, and no doubt in other language departments, the, um, the emphasis on, on writing, on creative writing, um, and both of you can speak much more about that, is, is becoming more and more emphasized, and more and more of the coursework is migrating over to people actually learning to write creatively. And it's, it's something that is, um, like all good things, uh, needs to really be tested and examined. And one thing that, that our faculty all the time uh, recognizes, both the, the um, creative writers in the department and the uh, cr critical writers in the department, is that, that uh, it's, it's very important for the two not to be severed. Um, because great poets, um, you know, T.S. Eliot, James Heaney, uh, et cetera, they knew the other poets. Um, they didn't just know their own poetry. So the danger is whether people um, begin to only write work, write, do their own writing, and forget to read the metaphysical poets, and forget to read uh, poets from many different countries. And to make a how do you ward off all the people who want to take your classes? Um, well, I think I have a very um, unpleasant reputation. But I, I, I agree with uh, uh, with Elaine. I, I actually um, I teach creative uh, something called creative writing, but I, I don't really um, think you can teach anyone. Uh, to write, um, so I don't. I think it should never be severed. Uh, and I think you know, I write. Someone wanting to write, if you are twenty or so, should probably not read a book uh, while you are trying to write. Should probably not read a book that was published um, after the nineteenth century. So there goes my royalties. <laughs> but. Uh, I I think you 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 should just um, read the people who came before. It's, I, I, I'm sorry that so many of the people who wrote before were all dead white men, but I find it forgivable because it's not entirely their fault that they're dead. Or, <laughs> I would say that uh, yes, the, the I am very I have my students read things like catalogues, plant catalogues, because they don't know how to describe anything, and uh, they you know, they don't really yeah you know, they all want to write some stupid thing, and, <laughs> um, and they should take yes I send all my students to the. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think behind this question of you know the cult of the writer, so so I'm, I'm uh, I will say with uh, almost certainty kind of against cults of of all kinds. Um, uh, the very idea of a cult is the idea of blindfolding oneself to the breadth of the world. Um, the the current engagement with the expressive, um, perhaps that is one of the tasks of art in cultures is always to move towards what is under-recognized. And however faultily this is being currently embraced, and it is often cliche and, and imitation, but I think we are living in a world in which um, the individual particularized self is being stamped by certain ideas of um, uh, uh, theologies of all kinds, um, uh, um, 
uh, the sort of mechanistic world of, of um, economics as it is experienced by so many. The stamping out of one's own experience uh, by this tsunami of given and offered templates of being. And so perhaps we can forgive this desire for everybody having a blog, everybody aspiring, everybody. I mean, this is, this is a counterweight to the stamping out of the self. The, the underside of it is the raising of ego. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Whereas the only reason to be expressive is to look at the world through the self that this is an instrument of knowing. And we want to know more than our own uh, narrowly circumferenced biography, and yet we know the world only through our own eyes, ears, taste, tongue, experience. And part of that experience for me has always been the great writings of, of the past, of people in translation from all times, all places. How will we ever know what the human is? if we don't go looking for it in every vocabulary of being which is made available to us, including our own, including others. There's no separation for me between these things. So it is, it is this desperate impulse for a living engagement, and that I think we must honor. Thank you to our wonderful panelists, and thank you to all of you.